This interview is part of a series that was started for, by the History Committee under the direction of Sidney Porter, Chairman of the History Committee, uh, to interview people who have, can tell us about the history of radiation protection, known as health physics. It's, January, it's February, February 1, happy February. February 1, 2000, and we're here in Virginia Beach at the Health Physics Society's Mid-Year Symposium. We are now interviewing Dr. Herman Sember, one of the leaders of the profession, one of the top scientists of the profession. We have some questions for Herman. I will call him Herman because he's an old friend. And also, that's my and name. It's his name. <laughs> it does not show disrespect. I can also call him Professor Dr. Herman Sember, but it would take too much time. I had a uh, student from Japan who called my wife Madam Dr. Professor Semper for real. That's Maybe good. I'll get to hear that <laughs> when I go to No, Japan. no, no. <laughs> anyway, I think it's good and logical to start with your early life. Uh, what do you remember as your earlier, earliest influences to become interested in education and learning? Oh, uh, I guess it was my parents. Uh, my mother especially was always harping on me how lucky. I was born a year after my parents came to the United States. Uh, and uh, they were always harping on me how lucky I was to be living in the United States where school was free and there was enough food to eat and nobody had to worry about these kinds of things and so on. Uh, and I really will say this sincerely, that it was, I think, my parents who influenced me too. That, Learning was part of our family culture, let me say. What did your father do for a living? He was a pushcart peddler. Good, good start. <laughs> and my mother was a home, uh, what do they call it, domestic scientist. She, <laughs> Like my mother? Yes. I see. My, my father, father thought about digging ditches, but he couldn't understand English, so they fired him. Oh, uh, incidentally, so, uh, my name in Europe, my father's name was Simbokovic. And when he came to Ellis Island, he said that the uh, the clerk told him that nobody in the United States would be able either to spell it or to pronounce it. So they cut off the coverage part, and there was like a sedilla under the sea that made it into a tz, and so it became converted to semper from semper coverage. If I were a violinist, it would be a great name. So where were you born, and where did you grow up, and how did that influence? I was born in Brooklyn, New York, and I grew up in Brooklyn, in the Williamsburg section and then the Brownsville section of Brooklyn. Now, how did that influence me? I, when I think back on the educational system in New York, I think it was fabulously good, except for the junior high school that I went to, which was in Brownsville, in the Brownsville section of Brooklyn, which for those of you who are in New, New Yorkers know, it's a pretty uh, low-level slum section. And I went to a, a junior high school called PS66, which I think everything that I've ever read about since then must have been the, one of the five worst schools in the United States. And I really didn't like it there at all. And uh, it was a school that went from seventh through ninth grade. And in eighth grade, the assistant principal, whose name is Mr. Cody, and of course everyone called him Buffalo Bill, uh, came into class and he announced something about some school called Brooklyn Tech, and that you had to take an exam to get into Brooklyn Tech. And uh, they wanted to know who would be interested in taking the exam. And I raised my hand and I asked him, I said, that. I said it sounds as though uh, if you go to Brooklyn Tech, you leave at the end of the 8B here, and you don't have to stay through the ninth grade. And he said, that's correct. So up went my hand to take the exam, and I got into Tech. And just as you went to Poly, Tech, I thought, was absolutely one of the best schools in the country. And I think most of what I learned in basic sciences, I learned in Tech, even though it was only a high school. There's some good schools in those days. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I graduated from Tech, and I didn't really, I was very naive about scholarships and things like that, but there was a scholarship that I applied for and I got, 
in the Missouri School of Mines and Metallurgy. And I... What year was this? Uh, well, I graduated in January of 1941, so that must have been in 1940. And I got a letter telling me that I got this scholarship, et cetera, and I was all happy and prepared, getting ready to go. The school would start in, in September, though, over there. I graduated from high school in January, and I, uh, everything was fine. I was planning to go to this Missouri School of Mines and Metallurgy. And then at the beginning of the summer, I got a letter from them that said that it would cost $300 for room and board for the year. And $300 then, when my father sold out the whole push cart every time, he made $3. So that would be 100 days worth of labor if we wouldn't have to eat and pay rent and things like that. So I had to turn down the scholarship. And when I graduated, I went to night school. I went to Brooklyn College at night and started out as pre-med. Uh, and I worked during the daytime as a machinist. And after a few years as a machinist, I uh, switched into uh, tool design and tool engineering. And I got rejected from the Army because I had an ulcer. The ulcer, I had, had a duodenal ulcer, which I got when I was 15. Uh, and uh, I was rejected. They happened to call me for the draft when, during October when I was really feeling quite sick. So I got rejected from the Army. So, and I had a steady girlfriend then, who you know. My lovely so, wife, yes, and we got married, and I went to college at night, and I was planning to go to medical school, and the plan was I applied to the, interestingly enough, to the University of Cincinnati, and I was accepted. To medical school? Yes, mm -hmm. and the plan was that my wife would work while I would go to school, and then she became pregnant, and so a very fine son. all of that... Uh, evaporated, uh, and then I switched to engineering. And I continued, I went to Brooklyn, I finished, I took about all the courses that I could in night school. I ran out of courses in Brooklyn College, and then I transferred to City College up, uptown. And I graduated from there in uh, 1949. And the... Uh, you were graduated cum laude, too. Yes. And Work, schooling school at night, working today. Yes. And you managed the machine shop. Well, by then I was working as an engineer. I was working, at that time, I was the engineer in a very small company called the France Ferrofilter Company. I won't describe to you what they, the details, uh, but there were a few people working there. And we, we made uh, magnetic uh, separators for the ceramics industry was our product. And the uh, thing that, uh, I'd like to tell you this because yeah. The, and you the, did something the, for the war effort then, too, there, too. same place? Oh, earlier than that. Earlier. Yes, I did something for the war effort. I, <laughs> thank you for asking. This is related to atomic bombs. Uh, I normally didn't tell my wife what I was doing when I was working, but uh, one of the things I worked on, I designed a bomb fuse for a 100-pound incendiary bomb, and two Army Air Force officers came and described how, what this was supposed to do, and so on. And it was going to be used by aircraft, in a low-flying aircraft, in support of advancing infantry. And uh, they told me that the incendiary material was some new kind of material, which was napalm. And uh, so normally I didn't tell my wife what I did, but I came home and I told her I was working on a new kind of bomb. And that was all, nothing else. Years later, two years, whatever it was later, when the atomic bomb was dropped, when I came home from work, all my neighbors were out in the street to congratulate me on the success of this new bomb that I had designed. My wife told all the neighbors that I had designed that bomb. <laughs> and then I set them straight, of course. Uh, uh, so you made up for not having to go in the service by helping the war effort in that way? Yes, yes. And maybe it was just as well for America, or better. Well, for me, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but uh, while I was working there, by the way, this is how, do you mind if I jump ahead and say how I got into this whole business? Yeah, that's one of the questions. Oh, please ask me the question. Yeah. How did you get into all this? Thank you. Now that you asked, I'll explain. Uh, 
I was working for this SG France company. We made electromagnetic separators for the ceramics industry. And for a while, nothing was selling. And these things had lots of copper in it, and they were very heavy. And they were just piled up. We, we were the factory, we were in a factory building, and we were one flight up on the first floor. Right under us was a saloon. And this was near police headquarters in, in the corner of <coughs> Grand and, and uh, Center Streets in Lower Manhattan. And uh, we were stacking up these separators that weren't selling, and I was worried about the floor caving in and, and doing some injury to people underneath. So I got the plan, the, 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 line, the floor loading, the permissible, that was 200 pounds per square foot, but we were putting tons per square foot on it. So, so I got the building plans to calculate what the actual weight was that it could support before we could expect it to collapse. Uh, and then suddenly the Marshall Plan was passed, and we stuck labels on all of that showing uh, Uncle, Han Uncle Sam's shaking hands with, if it went to Greece, there was a Greek flag, and if it went to France, there was a French flag, etc., on the sleeve of, and all these things left. Uh, and I was a senior club near to the end of my schoolwork, and uh, if you, I went to night school, and you have to understand that, at least I did, when I went to night school after work, I went to my first class, my second class, my third class, I usually took three courses, and then went home. And I really never went around the school to see what the school looked like. So when I took my very last final exam, which I remember was in thermodynamics, three hours was scheduled for this exam, and uh, I finished it in an hour and a half, and my wife wasn't expecting me home until much later. So I thought, gee, I ought to go around here and see what the school looks like. This is my very last night here. So I went by and I saw in the physics department office there was a notice of fellowships in uh, NRC slash AEC radiological physics. The NRC then meant National Research Council. And it paid, if with a wife and a child, I'd get $187.50 a month, which was pretty good. And I was worried about losing my job. I thought even though they, all these machines were given away in the Marshall Plan, what happens when the Marshall Plan ends? And since I didn't really produce anything, I was the tool maker in, in there and the turret laid up, or they built things that you could see. And all I did was calculate and make pictures. So I was really concerned about this when I saw 187.50 a month, I was inspired. And, but I had no idea what radiological physics was. So I ran down to the tech library, and there I remember still was a red-covered book called something about radiological physics by someone called Robertson. And I looked at it, and it was all about gamma rays and x-rays and neutrons and you know, whatever, all these things. And I thought, gee, this is all so exciting. So I went back into the physics department, and I got a, a, an application, and I had to write a full-page essay. You must have had to do that, too, as to why you wanted to study radiological physics. And apparently, I made up something, and, and uh, the next thing I knew, I had to take an examination, at which I took at Columbia University, and I met one of my very close friends still to this day, Frank Bradley, who applied for the same thing and took the exam with me. And we both passed the exam, and the next thing I knew, I got a telegram saying congratulations, etc., and I wound up in, at ORNL on the fellowship. So it was all luck. Number one, that I finished the, the thermodynamics exam in an hour and a half instead of three hours. Uh, yes, number two, that I was concerned about my job, um, and so by that. So it was really serendipity played a, a very large role in, in this. And so I wound up in Oak Ridge with Alan Brodsky as my, one of my classmates. We had a fabulous class then, by the way. Interesting how chance affected your life. Right? Yes. But you had to apply. You had to keep your eyes open. Well, I had to write that essay on why I wanted to be a radiological physicist. That's funny. I don't remind, remember writing the essay or taking the exam. I sorry, I did the essay. I don't remember the exam. Well, Bradley and I took the exam together, so you probably took one. 
Well, that's, that's very interesting. It shows how one can get into a career by keeping eyes open and looking at bulletin boards. That's right, reading them too. Well, who among your earlier teachers and mentors has, have made an impact on your career? You can maybe cover that now or even later when we talk about all the uh, well, I had several your... good teachers, look, just thinking back. In high school, my teachers were uniformly good. And I always think back and thank the Lord that I went to Brooklyn Tech, because I really think that that was one of the best. And even using today's criteria, or the criteria of those days, I think was absolutely one of the best schools in the country. And well, every teacher, I cannot think of a single poor teacher that I had. But in my own teaching, I emulate, tried, there were three teachers that I can think of. Uh, one was in Brooklyn College, Dr. Hudis, whom I had for physics, and at one of the electrical engineering courses, I think I had several courses with him, DC machinery and electromagnetic theory, yes. Uh, and I had uh, Mr. Edelstein, who was a superb teacher, and then in Oak Ridge, Myron Ferry. And in my own teaching, I tried to emulate those three. But I think they were just absolutely superb teachers. That's interesting. At least I was remember. able to understand best what they tried to teach. You can remember the style and, and I don't know what you're imitating. I do remember Myron Fair, but I guess you have your own style too. Maybe it's a combination or something you developed yourself. Well, as, I, as I say, I think it's a combination of those three teachers. You're widely respected around the world as one of the best teachers in the world. Thank you. Not because My grandmother, if she were alive, would appreciate that comment. What achievements do you consider your greatest or personally most satisfying? We really haven't covered your career though yet. Maybe we should go more into um, the fellowship program uh, briefly. Uh, what did that cover? And then into your positions that you have. Oh, the fellowship, pro well, you were in the fellowship program with me, but the people who are viewing this don't know. They don't. No, it was a lot of uh, physics and health physics and radiobiology and reactors. And remember, we used Fermi's notes for the neutron physics? That's right. And uh, it, we had the interesting thing is we had a lot of secret material. I think that's the, the, the physics, we, we took physics, health physics, in at ORNL, but we went for other classes, we went to ORINS at Orens, where we had courses given through the University of Tennessee. And that remember we took physics and math and various things so like we that. We took different things at, at our own choice. That was in addition to the regular program. You know? Yes. And I took mathematics courses. In addition to the regular took program. Some biology I took courses biology and, and I took physics. You dissected grasshopper, grasshopper embryos. Oh, like I fun, did. Didn't you? Well, it wasn't for fun. I was on a research project. I just kidding. Got my first publication out of that. Uh, no, but I we took I took courses in physics and and a lot of biology and, and uh, cytology and histology, and I remember those very well. Uh, we had nuclear physics and atomic physics in addition to what we had. In in uh, remember Dr. Wood was the name. Remember we did an experiment in Rutherford scattering with a spintheroscope? I remember that. I remember learning a lot of physics from I was looking Anderson. at it and Doc Emerson was taking the data, I think, as I recall. Yeah. At any rate, we went to we went to classes there, but that was not classified. But in, in the classes that we had at ORNL, we had bound notebooks that were distributed with numbered pages. And before we left, they collected all of those notebooks and looked through it, through it page by page. And we were not allowed to take any of those things home. So the question of studying uh, for exams came up. And when I went home, uh, when I got back to the room, uh, Les Rogers and I used to study together. We tried to recall from memory what we what we had had that day and, and made notes of that so that we could study for examinations. And of course, none, none of that stuff, it was all classified at the time, but when we look back on it, there was really no need to classify well, we did, that. Didn't we, just, uh, we studied a lot also though from Ralph, Ralph Lapp's book, Lapp and Andrew. Yes, the textbook Lapp we used in Dr. Anderson's books. class, yes. 
was Lap and Andrews. Oh, and Stranathan. Remember, we had a book by Stranathan. Right. Lap and Andrews were people who were into our profession a bit too. So we yes. still, I'm still in contact with Ralph Lap once in a while. Howard Andrews, I think he's completely retired, but he was active in our chapter in Baltimore. Yes, he wrote a great book in biophysics. Yeah, how that too. So we even got to meet some of the textbook writers, and now we are those. You are. That's what, the well, that's what happened. You are the you know. textbook writer. Herman, you're coming up with the fourth edition, are you? Writing? I'm working the on third, the fourth edition. Now. Third edition. Excellent. I, I, I use it in my courses. The fourth and then edition. You have, a, you, have a, you have a problem book with Tom Johnson. Yes. One the, of your the, own students. Right. We had the solution manual for the problems in the textbook, an introduction to health physics. And there, I, I want to write the new book for several reasons. In, in, the, in the third edition, I included a chapter on, on microwaves and on uh, lasers. And I sincerely believe that health physicists should be, because of the way the economy is going and downsizing of companies and and combining and trying to be more economical and to improve the bottom line. Uh, and because health physics and industrial hygiene are so closely re related, uh, that health physicists should know something about industrial hygiene because they will be called upon, or they are being called upon, to do industrial hygiene work. And if you're swinging a meter, it really doesn't matter whether you're measuring sound pressure levels or whether you're measuring radiation levels. Uh, and so I will include at least one chapter on, on an industrial hygiene topic. And right now, I don't know whether it should be an overview of ventilation with some design uh, examples or noise and noise control. But Sounds I would like, like to have one of those. Idea. I, I, I use some of the ventilation I learned in Pittsburgh to teach my students, as you know. And you give an excellent lecture on ventilation, so you could very well include that same kind of ventilation, the motion of air can take away radioactive particles as well as other particles. It makes no difference. If you're sampling for dust, the, the sampler and the whole procedure doesn't know whether the dust is radioactive or not. And so much of what a health physicist does is exactly the same thing as what an industrial hygienist does, that I think it's incumbent upon health physicists to learn industrial hygiene too. I look forward to your book. now. There's only so much tape that this gentleman brought with me. We could talk to you for a year, uh, but let's let's start and go back and I think maybe we can think in terms of time again uh, yes. to cover your experiences after the Elder Anderson program in Oak Ridge, your positions, the research, the teaching that led you into writing and putting together these teaching materials for other people to learn. Can you tell us maybe without my asking too many sure. questions? Sure, yes. Uh, about your research and your combined yeah. research, teaching, radiation safety activities in the early 60s after you were graduated. Oh, well, first let me say that uh, I, I, after we finished the fellowship, I would have given my right arm to remain in Oak Ridge, or my left arm because I'm right-handed. Uh, but I really wanted to stay in Oak Ridge. And on my own, I interviewed with Ed Struxness, remember him? And he hired me. I got a job. He was working in some aspect of waste disposal then, and he hired me. And when Dr. Anderson heard about this, she got me fired immediately. Really? Yeah, she wanted me to teach at Pitt, or to work at Pitt. <laughs> she, <laughs> so she guided your career yes, too? She, yes, absolutely. Oh, the neat thing about Dr. Anderson <laughs> is that not only was she a good teacher, but she was like a mother to every one yeah. of the students. She took a very deep interest and the personal lives, not the nosy interest, but a really deep interest in, in each one of the students in the, in the, in the I didn't school. I know she would get somebody fired for this. I yes. getting jobs. Well, she got to get jobs, but she didn't uh, get fired. But she took a very deep interest in everyone. And she, she, knew, thought, she knew you were an educator, I guess. She, she thought said. that, well, she placed everybody in where she thought the person would do best. So she got me fired from Ed Struxness and got me hired at the University of Pittsburgh. But well, she got you hired first before she got fired, though. Well, the two, I, I don't know the sequence in her mind, but that was the sequence as far as I knew about it. And uh, 
I got hired at the University of Pittsburgh. I got hired initially as a research associate. Uh, I, to, I had two jobs. I was to teach health physics and to be the RSO. We didn't, we call, I don't remember what I was called, but uh, the interesting thing about Pitt that I think should go into the history department here is that the University of Pittsburgh Graduate School of Public Health was the very first school that offered a course in health physics that was not supported by the federal government at all. And the reason for it is our dean, Dr. Perrin, who was just, he was one of the great people in my life, too. Tom Perrin was gone when I came. Well, then that was your loss. Uh, he was a, ab absolutely a great person. He had been the Surgeon General of the United States uh, during the administration of Franklin D. Roosevelt. And when Truman became president, of course, then the, the, the thing is that everybody resigns and the new president picks his own person. And so I guess he needed a new job, and the School of Public Health was founded. We opened our doors in 19, uh, 1950. And he was hired before that, and he hired the faculty. And he told me that he wanted to have somebody teach health physics because in 1929, his wife had had a radical mastectomy and was treated afterward with radiation. And they didn't really know much about the treatment modalities then, and dosimetry, and so on. And she was overexposed, and the nerves in her arm were damaged, and her arm was paralyzed as a result. Uh, and he's told me he thought that every doctor should know something about radiation, especially doctors who are going to treat people. Uh, and uh, he told me, he said he thought that if ever he had an opportunity to set up a curriculum with, where doctors would learn, he would include health physics. It wasn't called health physics at that time, but he said radiation safety and radiation dosimetry. And so this is why uh, the University of Pittsburgh had the very first non-governmental supported uh, program or course, and that developed into a program because I then applied for a, a research grant with the, uh, with the Atomic Energy Commission, which I got, and then I applied for money through the Rockefeller Foundation, which I got, and that, then we had a whole, it all blossomed out into a big program at the University of Pittsburgh. How did you uh, know that the avenue to take was the intertracheal installation of radioactive materials into the lung and so forth? We did inhalation too. We had inhalation chambers. And it, oh, because in, I switched to intratracheal inhalation, because intratracheal insufflation, because in, in an exposure chamber, you have to have very large amounts of activity circulating in order for the animals to inhale a relatively small amount and we were located in municipal hospital and uh, Jonas Salt was there too he was on I was on the fifth floor and he was on the third floor so I always say that I was superior to Jonas Salt but only in a geometric sense not in any other way and uh, when I was ready to do a big inhalation experiment where I have curie quantities circulating in the in the inhalation chambers there was a huge outbreak of polio, and we were physically located in Municipal Hospital, which was the Communicable Disease Hospital in Pittsburgh. And they had people, the, the place became full, full of patients with polio, and they had patients in the hallways in iron lungs. Okay. And I thought to myself, my God, if, if anything happened, and this stuff would get out of the inhalation chambers, it would just be terrible because you have all these people, and an iron, iron lung is the common name. It's really a drinker respirator, and Phil Drinker was the professor of, of industrial hygiene at the Harvard University School of Public Health. So the official name was Phil Drinker, but just like an accelerator is called Atom Smashers, that was called an iron lung. Was Drinker an MD? Was no, 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 no. I thought he was. No, he was not. He was like he was a, an engineer. Uh, so we had all these people literally in the hallways in these drinker respirators, and I thought, my God, if this dust, if anything happened, then of course they could happen. 
uh, it would just be terrible because all these people would immobilize in these very heavy machines. So I thought of intratracheal, not I thought of it because other people have done it too. So I thought of trying intratracheal injection and uh, I tried it. We opened up, for, first we did tracheotomies and injected it this way and then I did it through the mouth. Uh, Joe Watson and I were doing this, by the way. Uh, we, I did the intratracheal injection and then sacrificed the animal and made autoradiographs, sectioned the lung and made autoradiographs and found I got the same distribution. If you looked at the autoradiographs of the inhalation and the autoradiographs of the intratracheal injections, they looked pretty much the same. Even so I thought, yeah, lung. yes. So I thought, well, this is a heck of a lot easier than and, than, uh, than inhalation. And furthermore, we had control of all of the radioactivity. It wasn't running around, flying around in an inhalation chamber. And so we switched to intratracheal in, injections then. That's interesting. <clears throat> and we were able to make lung cancers in rats. And the lung cancers that we made were exactly of the same kind. We had several kinds, but we made bronchogenic carcinoma in the lungs of rats, which nobody had ever succeeded in doing before. And why, I don't know. Uh, but we did, and these were the same kinds of tumors that the miners, the uh, uranium miners, were getting. Did you have a pathologist to interpret the uh, slides for you? We had a pathologist. Uh, the first pathologist we had was a fellow by Lou Gamboa. He was a senior resident. And at that time, since I was working with this, I sat in on the patho I sat in on a lot of the classes in the medical school too, including pathology. And then I got a lot of private instruction from Gamboa. And then he left, and I think he went to Cook County Hospital after he finished his fellowship. And then we had another pathologist by the name of Dick Hel Helmstrom, Helstrom, who just spent an enormous amount of time with me teaching me pathology. The red light on means it's not working or it is working? It is working. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. A good deal of private instruction, high grade private instruction in pathology, first from Luke Gambo and then from Dick Hellstrom. And when Dick was the chief resident, uh, he let me know whenever anyone in the hospital died from any kind of a pulmonary disease. And the, if the person was going to be autopsied, he let me know when I was down there watching the autopsy. And he was an extremely good teacher because he had the patient's clinical record there. And as he was dissecting the, the cadaver, he was pointing out relationships uh, between what he found whenever he found anything and the clinical, the clinical course of the disease. So it was a great educational experience in that particular I sense. Did, I didn't know that you went through all that, but I did remember that when I visited you in 1951, you were already well into your research. You built your own accounting equipment because yes, you couldn't I buy it. Being in electronics and electrical engineering, he was able to build his own accounting equipment. I built a scaler, and, and then uh, I realized it's scaler. easy cheaper to buy it because <laughs> it took so long to debug and he it. Also, he also <laughs> had his cages, and he had his animals, and he was handling his little rats who he's so fond of. And uh, he also learned pathology. I remember he did a lot of his own pathology. So I was wondering yeah, I used to did. read my own slides and then things that I thought were of interest I gave to the pathologist. After a while, I learned to read my own you slides. You really did get into all aspects of this kind of research and, and your discoveries. You must have enjoyed it greatly. Yes. You continue on and tell us uh, the rest of your research and go into uh, your, your education at the same time, how you were received your doctorate in, uh, oh. in in biophysics at Pitt because I remember Don Ross, uh, he told me once about you. He said uh, they, they gave you a hard time on your final hour. You must have, you must have been a rambunctious student. In he said they asked you to drive all of Compton's equations on the board. Right. But and, that you did, was... and you were able to do it. Oh, did Don tell you that? That's oh. what Don told Okay, me. well, I must have told Don. Oh, one of, our, one of the people, we've had many, many students at Pitt who went on to become quite famous and contributed greatly to the fields of public health and industrial hygiene and, and health physics. And Don Ross was one of those. And I think he became the chief, went on to become 
the chief industrial he, hygienist for the Department of Energy. For many years, yeah. yes. Yes, he's retired, he's retired now, yes. Uh, anyway, I did uh, do my graduate work while I was at uh, Pitt. At that time, I was a student, not in the School of Public Health, because you were not allowed to be a student in the same school in which you're on the faculty. So I was a student in the biophysics department, which was in the graduate school. And the graduate school gave a PhD, and the School of Public Health gave a Doctor of Science degree. The requirements and everything were exactly the same. Uh, but for political reasons, they gave these two separate degrees. Uh, at any rate, I did my, uh, got my degree, my master's degree over there in biophysics. Uh, I, <laughs> the silly kind of a research that I did, I, the title of my thesis was The Lethal Radiation Effects of X-rays and fast neutrons on the embryo of the American cockroach. So I went to the Gulf Research Lab and got lots of cockroach embryos. Were you able to kill cockroaches with radiation? It's easier to step on them, but, but the, this is a very expensive way of doing it. Uh, but I, yes, I killed cockroaches with X-rays and with 14 MeV, with 14 MeV uh, neutrons. And the good thing about that is I used, I ran deuterons on on beryllium over there to get to get the neutrons, and I learned to at use Pitt, Pitt, at Pitt in the Pitt cyclotron lab, and I got to learn how to use the cyclotron. Did you do that before Bernie Cohen became? Bernie Cohen was not there yet. Not there yet. No. Uh, the one who came, I think, around that time or a little bit after was John Cameron. He came to Pitt uh, and worked in the cyclotron lab, and I remember him from back back in those days. So I did my master's thesis and got a master's degree, and then I continued on and made several proposals that my, uh, Dr. Laufer was my advisor, that he rejected. And finally, the one that was accepted was uh, a model for the kinetics of metabolism of mercury by the rat, by rats. Oh, so your discoveries for, of, uh Carcinogenesis of beta emitters alone didn't even count the no, dissertation. No, because my advisor said that's essentially medical research and that's not scientific research. So he didn't want to accept that. So I applied to NIH and got a grant on mercury. So I got into mercury toxicology pretty much. So even though you didn't have your doctoral degree, you could apply for a grant? Yes, and I got it. That's and unusual. it was supported for a number of years. And this was scientifically acceptable because you know what these mathematical models of, you know, these biokinetic uh, uh, models look like. So you draw a lot of boxes and you write a lot of lambdas and various things in there. So, so and I had seven simultaneous differential equations, you know, and that's very solve? impressive. How did you solve them? You didn't have a computer. You didn't need that, computers. And people How did you did solve it without, them? I was able to. I don't know. I, you didn't need That's all in your dissertation. I right. Can look it up. Yes. You can get by these things without. without I have math that does it for me now. I know. The interesting thing is when I had my thesis defense, I did my. Oh, I made measurements on, on the rats. In fact, values, numerical values for the parameters from the experiments. And I started to describe what I did, and I told Dave Halliday was on my committee of Halliday and Resident Fame. A book, didn't yeah, I said of Halliday and Resnick fame. Yeah. Oh, he wrote a book on, on nuclear physics also. Was he from Pitt? Or yes, he was at Pitt. He and, and uh, Resnick, Bob Resnick, were at Pitt. Uh, so so but, it shows how you got involved with physicists in this But program. Halliday was on my committee, and I said I did the measurements in a scintillation counter. So he interrupted me and said, could I explain how a scintillation counter worked? So I said, sure. And I started to do I drew a spectrum. I said, here's the Compton spectrum. So he interrupted me and said, could you derive the Compton scattering equations for the relativistic conditions? Did he do that to try to be hard on you, you think? I don't have no idea. So I said, sure. And I started to do it. And I filled up, I remember, blackboards and, <laughs> and you know, with all the trigonometry in it. And, and, it's mostly, and after that took up about two or three hours, I don't remember. And somebody said, well, we've seen enough, we've heard enough, and that was it. And I passed. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> <Right>. So <laughs> I never I, got around to discussing but, my research. But, but, I, but, I, but I heard that uh, they, they made it extra hard for you because you refused to do a, a 
a project that Laufer wanted you to do, and you did your own, went your own way. Well, right? he wanted me to work on on uh, some kind of bushy there's some kind of bushy stunt virus to be measuring molecular weights of some viruses. That's what he wanted. And I told him I wasn't particularly interested in that. I wanted to do. Was he really taken aback at that? No, he was a perfect. No, he, nice he, he did actually uh, like your, your decision. Oh, yes. Yeah, no, I, I can only say nice things about him. So that's good to know. No, he, his field of <coughs> research was virology. So naturally, he wanted me to do what he But he was, he was, oh, he was satisfied. That's good. Oh, you see, but if I would have <coughs> done his, what he wanted, it's not that I really wasn't interested in virology, but I would have had to go to his lab to do it. Mm -hmm. You see? In this way, I did the work that I did was in my own lab with my own research grant. And that was the main reason. You did wonderful work as a student, a graduate student. Can you tell us why you uh, left that wonderful situation when you got your doctorate and uh, you, left yes, the, I, you left the grants that you had uh, made and went to Cincinnati? Yes, I can tell you, now that you ask. I thought that I was there 10 years, and 10 years is long enough to be at the first job. And I just thought I go to go to another place. In, let me say, Did you seek that, out the job, or was it a... No, the, it, I didn't seek it out. Frank Prince sought me out and offered the job to me. Uh, but I just want to make a, one more comment. Before I realized that I was going to leave, do you know Ron Catherine? You know, that guy with the bald head? He was my first student. He's one of my best friends. Oh, so you do know him. Yes. I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> no, I know that. This is just joking around. Uh, but we were at a meeting, I believe it was in the Palmer House in Chicago, and I think it was an AIHA meeting, and Ron Catherine was there, and I struck up a conversation with him and spoke to him. I spoke to him about graduate school and how important it was to further his education and go on. And uh, I stood there in the hallway and had a long conversation with him and told him I was at Pitt and what a great school Pitt was and that he should apply to Pitt. For this. And I still think it was an industrial hygiene. You were still at Pitt when you told him this? Yes, yes. So you left uh, Pitt what? I left Pitt in 1960. 60. Yes. And so after I spoke to him, he thought that was a good idea and he applied for admission and he was accepted. And he keeps telling me, he says, and so when I got there, I expected to see you as a, on the faculty and you were gone. But so one of put up with Brodsky. He was probably very disappointed. Yes, he's told me that he had to put up with you. But one of my great accomplishments at Pitt was to get Catherine, Ron Catherine, to come to Pitt and be a student. And without joking around, Ron is really one of the giants who's contributed to our. He's to a fierce, the, very fierce thinker and fierce yes, writer. And, and to the just a master's. He'd only had about one or two years' experience before he went back to graduate school. Well, the, that, the transuranic registry, I think, is a, an no, enormous contribution no, just to, to the scientific going, database for our To keep the work. tissues of people yes. who have been radioactivity inside of them is an enormous contribution. We, we pushed for that back in the 50s. Much of the Division of Biology and Medicine hoped that that would come, would come to fruition someday. So he probably would not have been allowed to do that if he had not had the master's degree from Pitt. Came a full professor without a doctorate. Yeah. So did well, let me just point out so to you. Ken that Miller, another one of my students. Let me just point out to you that I think the single smartest person I've ever known was Professor Hatch, Ted Hatch. Uh, and I think from a technical and from every point of view, I think I learned more from him than from any other single person. And he did not have a doctorate. Had only a master's degree in civil engineering. But when the dean was away, they made him the acting dean of the school. That, the they other interesting respected. thing is he won the award one year, the Scientific Achievement Award from the American Medical Association for having the most significant uh, contribution to the field of medicine. Yes, I, I was lucky to be his student in, in industrial hygiene and ventilation design. After I was a student, I was fortunate enough to be appointed an associate professor with tenure on the faculty. So we were on some graduate committees together. So as a colleague, I got to know him. He was just a kind person. He was very smart. 
know, in every way he was great. He, he, as a he person, saved his own as a life by his knowledge. He saved his own life by his knowledge of uh, lung function. Do you know about that? He saved his own life. I think Remember he that? took his own life by smoking so much. Yeah, but 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 he was about to go on vacation when he was a colleague of mine. Oh yes, uh, with his wife, and the doctor did not have his X-rays back. The doctor said, "Go on vacation anyway." see your x-rays when you come back. And Professor Hatch, who wrote the book on the lung, was one of the pathologists later. And he also wrote Drinker, Drinker and Hatch, the first industrial hygiene book, when he was uh, an adjunct at Harvard. Uh, Professor Hatch thought, well, no, I, I'm not going on vacation. Something's going on down there. I want you to take a uh, look into my lung with a scope, bronchoscope, bronchoscopy. They looked into his lung, they found a large tumor. The next day he was in the operating table and they took out an entire lung. I visited him at his home a few months later. He was still a little weak, but not long afterward he was mowing the lawn again. Back, he came back to teaching. And he led out a, a, a thorough career. And then later on he, uh, he also fought the battle of cancer in his mouth from, from the pipe smoking, cigar smoking. Had on his top. But I think he died eventually at age 85. But he could have been, he could have left us many, many years earlier if he was not so astute in his own knowledge about the human body. The interesting thing is he gave up smoking before the cancer was diagnosed, mm -hmm. sometime before. His contribution, the thing for which he won the award in, in medicine, uh, he figured out a way to measure pulmonary function now, or much more than pulmonary, not, not just pulmonary function, but to, uh, to study the, get the diffusion across the membranes. This was before the days of xenon-133 and so on. By having the, uh, the test subject inhale various gases, one of them being carbon monoxide, and he had a probe and he picked up, measured the, con the concentrations of that in the blood while the person was sitting on a bicycle and doing things of this nature, and used several different, three different gases, and I don't remember which ones they were, and this was to enable, uh, to be able to diagnose the health status of a person's lungs. And they did it with, with miners and with people who worked in the roundhouse and the railroad and, and so on, and then he put himself on it, and he found out that his tests were worse than people with silicosis and worse than the miners. And he attributed he was always had something smoking in his mouth. Not when he, I knew him, he said stuff like he that. He gave yes, but then he gave up smoking as a result. Of That's that. interesting that you know the, the earlier history. Yes. And he wrote the book by Gross, Hatching Gross on Pulmonary Function. Yes. It came out later if you had left. Uh, but my one of the sad reasons feeling sorry about leaving Pitt was that I would leave the uh, Hatch as a, as a colleague. But in the late 20s, in 1933, I ran into him in the literature on another thing that he, he uh, was very well known for. He discovered the log normal distribution of, when he sifted particles through screens for the particle size distribution. Not only did he discover it, he's quoted in some of the leading mathematical textbooks on the log normal as the first one who's worked out some of the mathematical properties of the log normal. Yes. So being a mechanical engineer, he was good as a mathematical as a civil engineer. Yes. I thought he was mechanical. No, he was civil. He had a master's degree. Though. Yes, in civil engineering. I thought one of them was mechanical. No, he was civil engineer. I'm not sure of that. Anyway, uh, it's about the same sort of thing. And uh, But it shows that here is a man who <laughs> studied engineering, but he was good in fundamental mathematics, statistics, medical subjects, and so on. Industrial hygiene. And he called him the father of industrial hygiene. Yes, he was one of the organizers of the American Industrial Hygiene Association. And he's the one also who found the relationship between silicosis and the, the he, get, he derived the dose-response relationship between incidence of silicosis and years of exposure, and, and total exposure in units of milligram years. As I, as I said in my ERPA paper, I think that he was the first one to uh, get me to use log normal graph paper. And I've uh, submitted my yes. paper to ERPO on all my discoveries of the log normal distributions that I've seen in my career and how you can use them and manipulate them. So I quoted his two earlier papers on that. Anyway, that was one of the reasons arguing against leaving Pitt. But I thought I was there 10 years 
And I was an associate professor by then with tenure already. That's great. Um, but I thought I would go on to see greener fields and so on. And I went to the University of Cincinnati. And I became an associate professor of medicine. It was my official title. And it was in the Kettering lab, but that was part of the Department of Medicine at the time. So and you were only there a year before you went to uh, Switzerland. Yes. Right? You went to the International Labor Organization. Yes. Right? Standards. Right. For I safety for the world. Right. I spent one year writing safety things, safety, being involved in safety well, standards. How long were you at Kettering before you uh, left the University of Cincinnati and said, I take that leave? One year. Uh, you had some graduates. What did you do with them? Uh, there were other right. faculty, too. You, you didn't know. carry any of them over to Pits uh, Switzerland? No. But I think you did supervise some. Oh, yes, yes. From afar? From afar. Did that work and out? Yes, that worked out. Who were your students that you uh, uh, remember? One of those students, he's a health physicist now. He's a CHP in, Los, in the Los Angeles area. Still active? Huh? Still active, huh? yes. This is a, he got his doctorate? Yes, he got a doctorate. And you had some master's students also there? Yes, had a whole bunch of them, as a matter of fact. Uh, I was just thinking, Al, Al Miller came, oh no, Al Miller came when I left Cincinnati, went to, to Northwestern, and Al Miller left the, and came with me when I transferred to Northwestern. But I was at University of Cincinnati uh, till 1965. You came back? After what, two well, years? After two one year. year. One year it was a two-year appointment, but I came you back. You were in Switzerland after. only one year? Only one year. Only one year, yes. And then how long were you there at Cincinnati before you went to Northwestern? Uh, well, I went to Northwestern in 1964, but I continued teaching in, for another year at Cincinnati because the, uh, the chairman of my department, Dr. Kehoe, another very, very, very well-known name in industrial hygiene, uh, said to me, he said, well, if you go to Northwestern and you don't like it, you might want to come back here. If we accept your resignation, then according to the rules, they have to start a whole new faculty search and set up a committee. So he advised me, he says, why don't you just take a reduced salary and a reduced <coughs> teaching load, and you'll come back one day a week. So I did that. Rummersfield, Phil Rummersfield was the name of the student who, uh, who I had from, from afar. And Is he I, a PhD student also? Yes, and he's a CHP too. Also, yes. Uh, so I did that, and after a year, I decided that I liked it at the Northwestern, so I stayed there. So then you I had a great time. career there. Let's see, how many years were you there? Well, technically, I, well, I retired in 19. I don't really remember when I retired officially because I then went on halftime, and. Although I was officially or technically at halftime. Uh, Were you called emeritus then? Yes, I was called emeritus. I was there halftime, uh, but I actually put in full time. So I don't really remember when, I, <laughs> when this happened. But uh, you, uh, you built up a program there. Yes, we had a, had a research program as well as a teaching program. Yes, we had a And big, you taught industrial hygiene too and air yes, pollution. Yes, we had a course, a, a program health physics, and one in industrial hygiene. Well, originally the industrial hygiene program was started by Ed Herman. And then when he retired, well, he didn't retire, he left. He left after I was there a few years. Then I took over the direction of the industrial hygiene program. But programs. I was teaching industrial hygiene uh, while Ed was still there. So how could you, as one person, have several programs do all that teaching? The bad part of it is I only got one salary. See, if I had gotten two salaries, it would have been better. Well, did you have some help? Did you have some faculty? Uh, I had technicians working in my lab, and I had very good TAs. One they'd say, other faculty. Yes, I was at Northwestern. I was in the Environmental Health Engineering Department, and we had a fabulous group there. And was that under civil engineering? That was in civil engineering. Yes, civil engineering was about eight little sub- Departments. There was mechanics and fluids and, and concrete and environmental health. Well, when the first when I first came, it was called sanitary engineering, and then the important buzzword became environment. So we changed it to environmental health. Was that a good place to have a program like this? Uh, yes and no. 
my interest was more in the biological aspects of it than when I first came there. There was relatively little interest in biological aspects. But everybody thought I was so I was unique because here I had animal rooms and animals and doing all these kinds of things. So yes, it, it was a good place. Yes, the administration, the dean was just absolutely supportive in every way, and, and I can only say good things about them. Okay, we, we had, can you remember any of the, any other students or people you'd like to talk about uh, as far as your academic career there? Well, normally I don't like to talk about people, but I had a number, a number of students who turned out very well and have contributed and are con continuing to contribute uh, to the field of health physics and industrial hygiene. And if we're thinking of health physics, the I think right now the name that most people would recognize is Keith Eckerman, uh, who's on all the ICRP committees, or ICRP2, yes. and is the, the big name, I think, in industrial dosimetry. In addition to you, he's another person I recommended for the, only, for the Distinguished Scientific Achievement Award because he stepped into Walter Snyder's great big shoes, the great big mathematician, and he floated and brought in contracts and continued to work, and he's been very successful. And so he, he must got have it. done. He must have done a good job teaching him his math and his physics and his biology. He tried. <laughs> what was his dissertation? Uh, he was looking at uh, the possible measuring lead to ten in the bones, and specifically in the skull, as an index of the lead burden in a person. Did he do some mathematical modeling? With yes. Simultaneous equations, yes. differential equations? You know, all these. He was good at that. Yes. See well, that. as we see I now. I knew him when he came to the Nuclear Re Re Regulatory Commission for a while before he went to Oak Ridge to fill Walter Snyder's uh -huh. and he was uh, He was involved in a lot of the computer design of the calculations there as well. And it was amazing to me how he could fill in the shoes of Walter Snyder with just a small group of cracker check physicists working for him. Bob, well, Bob Bernard worked for him for a while until Bob retired. Bob, the biological mathematician, or mathematical biologist. Well, <laughs> Keith is a very competent fellow. We had a whole bunch of competent people, competent students who graduated. Uh, Don to, Ross, as I said, well, Don Ross graduated Pitt. From, from Pitt. Al Miller, I think, who contributed significantly. He, uh, he retired not long ago from Bell Labs. He was the, the chief industrial hygienist at Bell Labs. And when Bell Labs was split off from AT&T, he retired from there. And I think he's now teaching, or part-time teaching since he's retired, in Bowling Green University or Eastern or Western Kentucky. He's down in Kentucky now. Which of your students have contributed to the greatest to research in addition to Keith Eckman? Do you remember? Uh, I think Bob Phillips, although he's now working he's for the FDA, Washington, yeah. yes, he's in Washington, I think he contributed uh, to the field of research. Uh, Ted Thorson, who's now, I, the last I heard, was the vice president for research at Varian, mm -hmm. and he's contributed significantly at the CLINAC and the development of those kinds of things. Uh, you have students all over the world, I know, and you keep in touch with your students better than a lot of people. Well, Egypt, I have, yeah, we various have. Studies, various places. Yes, one of my former students is now the dean of the faculty of medicine at Cairo University. Uh, Gamal. Uh, well, it's, I know it's hard to remember the way that uh, these names are when you're asked. Oh, I'm probably. sure you would you'd remember them any other time. Uh, and but, uh, uh, Alex Donaghy in Israel. in Israel. He has a big job there. Yes. Well, he's retired now. Too. Makes me feel old when my students are retired. Uh, well, Ron Cather, my students retired. I had uh, a student from Syria, Halawi, who was a real big wheel over there in the Syrian Ministry of Health. Uh, I had uh, from South Africa, I had students, and as a result of that, I was able to get a Visiting professorship at Stellenbosch University uh, in South right. Africa. That's right. I remember you spent a year in Israel and you invited me over to stay with you for a week at a conference. Yes, there. I had a paper. I had a Fulbright. Uh -huh. I had a Fulbright fellowship at, at the Hebrew University. What other overseas jobs did you have? Oh, I spent three summers. Uh, well, 
I spent three summers in Copenhagen uh, working for uh, the World Health Organization and the ILO. Uh, I had others. I spent several summers at Tel Aviv University, three or four or five, I don't remember exactly. Uh, I've spent several uh, summers working at the Nachal Sorek Research Center in Israel, the Nuclear Research Center. Uh, Shows you're in demand all over the world. Well, that's not all over the world, but it's limited portions of the world. Oh, I've been in Karlsruhe for a short while. And, uh, and, and, oh, Karlsruhe was in Karlsruhe, Germany. Uh, oh, and East, I spent some time in East Berlin also under the auspices of uh, the IAEA. Yes, and that's something else in mind that you did. Of course, you won many awards. I had the honor or pleasure of presenting you with the Distinguished Scientific Achievement Award, our highest science award in the Health Physics Society, but you've also been a contributor professionally and a leader. You've just recently been chair of the American Academy of health physicists. Yes. Which is the professional society for all certified health physicists. That's correct. It's a marvelous Yesterday a marvelous I became the most recent past president. Yes, president. <laughs> I turned the uh, reins uh, of government uh, over to activist. Chuck Ressler, who was also one of our students, by the way. Was one of your students? Yes. Oh, he and Jen were. Jen was not one, one of our one students, of but, but Jen Chuck uh, was. We're in Florida as, as co professors. Yes. Many oh, years. yes, you talk about former students, Chuck Ressler. Yeah, that's wonderful. And Tim Miller, I don't know, do you know Tim? Tim is the one who very well verbalized to me what's wrong with the health physics programs. He said he learned a lot about health physics and industrial hygiene, and he could do all kinds of calculations, make all kinds of measurements, and because he could do these things, he got promoted. So now he's the deputy director of their environmental division. And he deals now with everything. They have a buffalo herd outside. But he told me that for years he hasn't done a single scientific thing. All he does now is push paper around. And he, he looks after federal regulations and state regulations and union rules and, and things of this nature. And he told me that the best way to improve the our graduate program in health physics was to have not one but several courses in how to deal with unions and how to deal with the government and how to deal with wildlife management because they have a herd of buffaloes there, uh, sanitary, you know, waste disposal uh, from the, uh, the, the uh, care in the cafeteria to look for cleanliness in the cafeteria and so on. So all of that is now combined over there health physics, industrial hygiene, sanitation, it's all into one group. Are you teaching me something else? Uh, you know, I always said, like I said for many years, uh, health physics is as broad as the whole field of public health and scientific discipline. Now I'm realizing that I should expand this uh, beyond what I've already said. Health, well, health physics is as broad in management disciplines. That's right. Uh, well, Tim said the problem is if you do well in these things, you get promoted up into something in which you have no so training, and it. then you don't get promoted any yeah, further. That reminds me, some of our health physicists, find no, health physicists become deans and... Uh, yeah. No, no, he's a him is extremely competent. And uh, you work for Paul Zimmer, who is dean of a school of health science. Yes. So it shows that this kind of profession can lead in many areas, and I would like to remind us of uh, Jim Hart, a wonderful man, who was a good friend, who was a chemist, got a law degree, didn't practice law, but he wrote the rules and bylaws of this great society. And he got it, be, it became uh, re, reincorporated, I think, in Tennessee as a result of his efforts. And he had much to do with the beginnings of ERPA, writing the rules of ERPA and the bylaws. And he, he died in the middle of his presidency. Yes. I would like to just remind him, he said he wrote the bylaws and rules. I remember when we organized, the first organization meeting was held for the Health Physics Society, and I think you mentioned before, it was in Frank Bradley's house in Columbus, and uh, we were there, and Dr. Anderson and Myron Fair and Casey Morgan and, and all of these big wheels, big names, and so on, 
And of course, we had to have a dinner. You have to have a banquet in all of these things. And this was in, in Frank Bradley's house. And my wife was there, and Bonnie Bradley was there. So the very first health physics dinner was cooked by my wife and by Bonnie Bradley. And I think that ought to be recorded in the yes. historical archive somewhere. Yes. Herman has a very lovely and brilliant wife also. He's a wonderful friend, and a wonderful friend of the profession. Uh, she's an educator, too. Yeah, she's now retired. Retired educator, so yeah. Yes, uh, she's a tired educator. She got tired. No, she didn't get tired of that. Uh, she's a retired educator. Yes. And we can go on and talk about education. Well, I wish we could talk with you for another week. This has been wonderful. Uh, it's hard to catch Herman. He's always on the fly. And when you see him in the hallway, walking down the hall, it may be surrounded by 10 to 100 other people and students who stop him, and it's hard to get near him. So this has been a very I just Can I say one more thing about education? I also teach uh, by distance learning for Georgia Tech. I teach industrial hygiene in their health physics program. And last year when I came to the health physics meeting, the, the Georgia Tech had a booth, a health physics uh, a booth in the health physics meeting. And it was manned by the students, by several students. They all shrieked when they saw it and said, oh, I'm a real live person. So I had an appointment as a visiting professor at Georgia Tech, but I've never been to Georgia Tech. <laughs> and I do it all by television. You know, I have a monitor, and I see the students in front of me on the monitor. And they see me, and then I see another monitor where how I look to them. And I can talk to them directly. It was all live. It's a marvelous so that, that, that well, Distance learning is really a great, uh, a great uh, thing. Well, thank you, Herman, for submitting this interview. You know, it makes me realize that you're a walking embodiment of all the various opportunities in medical science, physical science, mathematics, all the things you have done in research, teaching. You're a walking embodiment of what I've said about this profession. I am. That it's as broad as a field of <laughs> public health. And yes. I don't mean you're overweight. Uh, no, and let me just say a parting thing. In my own mind, I think of radiation safety practice as one of the subdivisions of public health. I think you're right. And it's, it falls in the field of public health because we are dependent. We have no senses for anything on this. So we don't know what's happening around us. And so we have to uh, wait or depend on somebody else to tell us to, to regulate these things because of the big population implosion. So I wouldn't know if, if you didn't bathe and had BO and you sat next to me, I would know about it. I would I'd have a sense of smelling this. I don't mean to imply that you do, but, but, to, but if you had a, a radioactive implant in you, or if you had some technetium 99M and just came out from a bone scan, you would be irradiating me, and I would know it. And uh, so we do need public health standards and uh, regulations in order to, we need public health efforts in order to protect and guard the health of the public. And the health of the public is not the same thing as public health. Public health is the actions that are taken by organized community efforts, such as governments and so on, to protect the health of the public. Get, getting some lecturing in here. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so okay. we uh, adjourn. Super. Thank you. That was wonderful. Yeah, it was super. Hey, we got dozens of names. Actually. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's uh, perfect. perfect. Herman, thank you so much. Okay, now which production producers of movies get to see these things so that we might get offered <laughs> contracts? <laughs>
fact, exactly yeah. the next oh, yeah, question. Oh, yeah, no, no. I, 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 I was I worried about the time, but uh, that's good. No, 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 no. Well, as far as I'm concerned, I'd like to sit here for a week. No, no, no. <laughs> just, you know, you know, you have another three or four yeah, minutes. Yeah, that's a good idea. Maybe a little uh, bit more on that. You're right. Yeah. yeah that should be emphasized because uh, it yeah. says the Health Physics Common, Society. You've been a member of the Health Physics Society since, since when? Since its inception. Since its well, we inception. Well, about, talk, how, talked about the inception, how yeah. How has it molded, shaped, uh, your ability to teach, your, able, uh, your ability to work with people, uh, your, uh, your multi-disciplined uh, approach to problem solving, from mathematics all the way to people skills. Is it, is it? Okay. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. That sort of question. Shall we, are we on? Yeah, I kept it running. Okay. Herman. Yes. As I said before, that's you know, my name. <clears throat> I appreciate the fact that you're one of the early people at, at the home of Frank Bradley starting this great society, where it's a health physics society, which is one yes, of those. Yes, it's a great, but not a great. The great. But you belong to Johnson many. started the great society. Yeah. <laughs> but but you, you belong to many societies, of course. But let's focus, since this is the history committee of the health physics society, well, starting from the time you remember it was created. What effects did it have on you in terms of guiding and helping your profession in teaching and research and in and in the creating and the helping of other people advance into the profession and on their way as they have, as your many students have? Okay, it had a <coughs> multifaceted influence. How's that for a good word? It had it, so I'm saying that seriously. Uh, one way, one of the facets is networking and getting to know other people and, and uh, getting to know others in my profession and what they do and I got to know many of them very well. I could talk to other people who do work similar to what I was doing, such as Sid Laskin of blessed memory, he's now dead, and uh, Bill Baer, whom I got to know very well very many years ago, and Bruce Becker, and uh, Jack Little up at Harvard, and I got to meet all of these people mainly as a result of coming to meet. As a result of coming to meet. So <coughs> although you might think that listening to papers is the main thing, the main thing is meeting, in my opinion, is meeting the people and discussing the research with them. And listening to the papers, I could see what other avenues there were. So and nobody more working in other areas. Right. And no idea is ever really, really, really original. It has to you need some experience on which to base an idea. And the ideas, although, and I hate to say this, that now the meetings of the Health Physics Society don't deal with research very much. They deal with regulations and public relations and well, I won't you know that because you go to the meetings too. But uh, many, many years ago, and for a very long period of time, the Health Physics Society meetings really were scientific meetings and they were all research papers. And when you went to the meeting, you heard the cutting edge of, of radiation safety science. And whether that radiation safety science dealt with biological effects, whether it dealt with dosimetry, uh, whether it dealt with instrumentation, they were, it was really advancing the fields of knowledge. And by going to those meetings, I was able to see what the various avenues, as you pointed out, that health physics includes many, is a very multidisciplinary field, and there were papers on, on the radiobiology, and there were papers on instrumentation, and there were papers on dosimetry, etc. And really, all of these, we separated these fields out for administrative purposes. When it came down to practice, all of these things interacted into a single unit. And it was coming to these meetings, I think, more than anything else, helped me to see that these were all parts of a big puzzle that all fitted together to make a single picture. And I think that the, the, the networking and seeing the kinds of research that people were doing and how it all fit together and how it all could be integrated, I think was very influential in, in my development in the field of health physics. And you also contributed to the certification process, haven't you? And that's why you were nominated and elected to be the president of the American Academy. Oh, I was the president. Yes, I'm now the most recent past president. Till yesterday, you could have called me Mr. President, but now I'm Mr. Past President. You've been a supporter of the certification program. 
Google. Yes, of course. Yes. Uh, and the I bequeath my successor was Chuck Ressler, who was an excellent person. I'm sure that the AAHP will continue to grow under his presidency, too. I was pleased to uh, be the president well, for the I year. And my main, what I tried to do, my main thrust as president was to try to integrate the other, the non-radiological sciences or activities such as health physics and safety engineering in to get the health physicists to recognize that these are important components of our field and to incorporate more training and, and education in those fields. And we saw uh, uh, the, the PEP courses now and the AAHP courses, for example, the next one we're going to have an eight-hour course on, on the physical agents, the non-radiological physical agents. So we're trying to, and I think we're succeeding, and that was my main thrust, my main desire as the president, and I think that I succeeded at least partially in that particular aspect. Excellent work, Erwin. I wish you the enjoyment of many more years of your creativity in this field. Thank and you. I'll be looking forward to your next textbook, which I hope to use as well as the other three I've been using. <laughs> Thank you. I hope that the next one should be out. If I say two years, that means four years, because you really always have to double these estimates. Okay, well, again, thanks, Alan. Thank you very much. talking to you here, and good luck to you. Thank you. Great. Great. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Very good, very good. That, 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 okay? yeah. that, that was, was fun. Nice, that was, was a nice super. way to, that's nice a good way. idea. Very, very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Super. Do I get a free copy? Yes, sir.